Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Floof Talk, the show where your favorite fuzzy folk discuss anything and everything you want. If you have any suggestions for tonight, be sure to put them in the Floof Talk text chat right above this voice chat. And if you're watching on Twitch, you can post them in the Twitch chat and our fabulous streaming admins will pass them along. So before we start, I'd like to remind everyone to please mute your microphones. Any discussion you have can go in the speaking voice right above this chat. Anyway, I'm your host, Nova the Bass Skunk, and I'm here with leader of Furry Valley and the living embodiment of ASMR, Simba. Simba, it's great having you here tonight. How are you doing? I'm good. I won my League of Legends game before we started playing, so that's got me in a good mood. So let's, let's carry it on. How are you doing today? Oh, other than absolutely exhausted, I'm doing all right. Pretty standard, then. Yep. You know me. If I'm not running on caffeine, I'm asleep. Yep. <laughs> know the feeling. Alrighty, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our first topic for tonight is going to be public speaking. And this is something both of us, obviously, we both have a lot of experience <laughs> doing this. <laughs> it's quite topical, I guess, given that we're, I suppose, well, not maybe not hugely public speaking at the moment, but it's, you know, in front of 30 people or so, 20, 30 people. So that's... Uh, that's something I think even smaller crowds like that, a lot of people have trouble with. Why do you think it is that people find it difficult? You know, I think there's a lot involved uh, in your basic conversation. You're going to, yes, uh, all eyes might be on you, but it's only for a short period of time as long as you're saying your piece. But when people think of public speaking, they think of public speaking classes, you know, doing a podcast like this, uh, lectures, uh, stuff where they're going to have to have all attention for extended periods of time, and it's not just a furry thing. Initially, I think furries being uh, a rather shy of that sort of thing, but even rather confident people I've met in real life have issues with public speaking. Do you think it's that people don't want to be the center of attention? I think it's more so that you're not really held to any sort of scrutiny unless you're talking serious topics in a conversational manner, but mm -hmm. when you're public speaking, then everything's going to be judged. The content, the way you say it. Uh, I had to take a public speaking class in college, and they graded you on stuff like making eye contact and uh, having approachable body language, stuff like that. It really forces you to look at the way you're speaking, and I think for a lot of people, that's uncomfortable. I guess online at least it makes it a little bit more uh easy for people to get into because you don't have that sort of eye contact and have to look at the people and check you're engaging it, it takes away a dimension but uh perhaps in some ways i know talking on the phone i can find more disconcerting because i don't have i can't look at the person to sort of figure out oh what do you actually think about what i'm saying uh i think for one-on-one -on -one conversations i find that more difficult but talking to a group of people i probably find it easier online if it's something i'm passionate about i really don't have a problem speaking about it in any sort of context but i actually found and this is just the way i viewed it that when i have tried to learn public speaking i just totally depersonalize myself i don't think it is me uh conversing with people or putting myself on the line more so than i am just putting thoughts into words and i know that doesn't really make a lot of sense but at the same time, I try to, I, I'm more comfortable when I feel they're gauging me on the validity of what I'm saying as opposed to how I say it. So and sort what of the, the factual content of what you're saying rather than your delivery of it. And mind you, both are important, but I think when I focus on that uh, delivery less, mm -hmm. then I don't try as hard and that makes it a lot more comfortable. I, I think as well, if you're confident about the topic that you're delivering you tend to deliver it in a much more convincing way i think it is probably more important how you say what you're saying rather than the content of what you say um but it's much easier to say it in the right way quite naturally if you're confident with the topic and i think i feel much more comfortable presenting to first second year undergraduates who i know okay even if i don't know this perfectly even if i mess up a little bit of something here and there you guys are not going to be able to know that i've messed up and so i think i feel much more confident presenting to say first and second year undergraduates because i know that even if i make a little bit of a mistake with what i'm presenting they're not going to notice and they're not going to be able to call me on that sort of thing but presenting to my peers 
I, I feel a lot greater sense of scrutiny that everything I say, well, if it's slightly off, then even if it's not vocal, there's the perception that, oh God, I'm being judged. <laughs> it's quite uncomfortable. Uh, so having the confidence in the topic to know that I know it better than anyone else in the room makes it a lot easier when it when it's about a factual thing if it's an opinion thing I'll talk to anyone about um, that, that sort of thing but um yeah so just how many people have you led astray in your undergraduate lectures where mm -hmm. they're six years into their masters or whatever and they're uh, they get something wrong on their paper but Simba said it so it must have been right well, uh, this is more the case in high school. Uh, we teach kids in high school a lot of things that aren't actually true, uh, just because it's simple and they are able to understand it. If we if we started talking about the actual reasons why physically and chemi chemically and mathematically these things are true or not true, you just confuse them and they wouldn't. Uh, at, at that age, it's important that they get the basic gist of what you're saying so they can apply it to whatever situation they might come up to they don't need to know the intricate you know uh extraneous cases of why this isn't actually true it's just an approximation i mean e equals mc squared is a good example it's not actually true but most people think it's true it's just that the it's an infinite series and the next term in the series is generally quite small so we uh <laughs> don't tend to ever mention it but it is there um and that's probably something which no one listening knew. <laughs> Very few did, but yeah, that's a lie. Um, uh, you'll have to go into detail about that in another floof talk at some yeah, point. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever heard this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, I mean, very, very, it's it's not too complicated. Very simply, uh, the E equals MC squared formula comes from the expansion of an equation. And it just so happens that there are other terms in the equation. It's E equals MC squared plus, I think the next term is like a half of MV to the power of four or something. Um, but that term is relatively quite small. And therefore, we just ignore it. We say, OK, e equals MC squared, no problem. <laughs> so I guess as far as most people hearing that are concerned, uh... E equals mc squared is right unless you're actually going to be studying it further. Right, right, right. Unless you're near the speed of light. Yeah, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Yeah. Relativistic effects don't apply to things that are moving relatively slowly. So. Uh, we did get a comment from Vulan who said he has too much social anxiety to actually talk. And I do have some social anxiety. It's something I've had to uh, work on actively for the last several years. I've gotten much better with it. and. First off, it's about practice. You're never going to get better if you don't try, and it takes failure to ever get better. So, mm. yeah, it's going to be rough learning, but you got to start somewhere. And I'd also mention, uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to say, do you feel that uh, you feel social anxiety because the people around you might judge what you're saying, and so you, you want sort of social approval on what you're saying? Well, what makes you anxious exactly? Uh, for me, I'm a very obsessive thinker, and mm -hmm. I know when I do something incorrectly, be it something I said or the way I said it, I kind of fixate on that, and that's something I've had to practice on not doing, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I realize that, you know, I care much more about it than anyone else cares about it. Yeah, oh, so, so when you present, if you say uh, the wrong word, you're like, oh, no, I said that wrong word, and it, you can't get it out of your head sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, that can be quite a self-conscious experience, I guess. But I think slowing down and speaking more clearly, taking a little bit of time before you answer each question or uh, say the next thing that's on your mind, that can help with that. And I do want to bring up the depersonalization thing again. Uh, a big thing of, uh, with what helped me was I joined debate. And debate is, even though it's a public speaking sort of thing, it is almost purely academic and it's something where you're uh, subconsciously you're still going to be judged in the way you say it but uh, the content comes before anything so you get a lot of practice at just uh saying the right things as opposed yeah. to how to say it, and then you can worry about the minutia later yeah i mean i think that's true in an academic debating context but you look at parliament and you look at congress and you think well is it really what they argue about or is it how convincingly they present it to the public i think it's um, whether you're being judged by an audience or whether you're being objectively judged makes a large difference there. And I prefer the latter, of course, I, mean, I think you're the same, but I think often in real life, the former is 
more important, sadly. Well, politics for the, I mean, forever has always been more so a, a circus show than it ever has been about genuine and authentic debate. Maybe once upon a time, but... <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. Maybe that's a good, uh, good point to move into our next topic, which is about, uh, well, left, left v. right. Uh, uh, this was about uh, the difference yeah. between uh, extremism on both sides. Okay. Uh, this is something I feel rather strongly about because oftentimes I find it to be a false equivalency. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do a, uh, there was a study done by the Department of Homeland Security, and there has been something like all of one uh, death attributed to left wing extremism in the last 40 years. Whereas I think it's 81% uh, is done by uh, right wing homegrown extremism in America. The other mm -hmm. 18 being a radical Islamic terrorism. Mm. I think um, I'm, I'm not sure that's the best metric to judge it by. Um, extreme far left stuff is far more prevalent of a problem online. Now, you're not going to kill anyone by deplatforming them or flaming them on social media, but that can still have a profound negative effect on a person. And you're right, but. At the same time, it's, and, and I hate the argument, there's a great tweet by Tyler, the creator, I will not read verbatim because that's not appropriate, but he essentially says, how is cyberbullying real, lol, just close your eyes and look away from the screen. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we live in way too integrated a society with our technology where that's just not possible. You kind of have to have a social media if you're ever going to have a professional life, and that's unfortunate. But right. at the same time, there is definitely a difference between someone online bullying and someone bombing churches. I mean, that, that is true, but you have to look at the volume. How many people are extreme enough to bomb a church? Very, very, very few. But how many people are extreme enough to try and get someone fired from their own employment? A lot more. And those tend to be the people on the left. So you could argue that, although it's a lesser individual um, crime, I mean, I'm not sure criminal is the right word, but uh, it's a lesser individual problem, but there's more of it. And so when you multiply it up, well, it could easily equate. It's hard to kind of create a metric for this, but... It is, yeah, yeah. From my own experience, I... I mean, until until not not much more than a year ago, I used to be very much um, of the opinion that the far right was very, 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 very bad, very much of a problem, and the far left didn't exist. And it's only by being attacked by the far left that I've realized, wait, that isn't just something made, because I, I used to, perhaps naively, I was under the opinion that the far left was a construct in, uh, basically created by people who voted for Trump to excuse Trump. And, you know, well, why have we voted for someone who molests women? Well, because the, the far left, the far SJWs, you know, and, and so I thought it was a fake thing. But, uh, but then yeah, I, I, I realized um, quite, uh, quite negatively that it is a real thing. And, and so I think since then, I've had more problems with far left people and I don't see far right stuff online and it might be that it just doesn't appear much in the furry community which is where I spend most of my time um and in the online world but I mean I, I know it's I know it's out there but it doesn't seem to shove itself in your face quite so readily uh, part, I don't think that uh, labeling it a uh, left wing uh, labeling it left wing is necessarily correct. I think it's more so just a problem with outrage culture. Uh, yes, it's still exists. Outrage culture is more on the left than the right, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely not. Hmm. Have you ever no. seen a right wing uh, meltdowns in America where uh, a Yeti? Online, or... though, I'm talking. Online, I'm talking. Oh, well, that's where it mostly takes place. Uh, a Yeti decided to pull their sponsorship from Fox, so a whole bunch of conservatives went out and. Uh, tweeted, Facebooked, whatever, the videos of them shooting their coolers. Uh, <laughs> same thing with the Nike thing. 
uh, Nike stood with Colin Kaepernick, so they started burning their shoes. So why don't you think that in furry we see this sort of thing? Do you think I... it's because furries are generally very liberal anyway, and so there's a much larger volume of left-wing furries than right-wing furries? Uh, well, that's definitely part of it. When I last mm -hmm. uh, did the research, uh, most furries put themselves at something like a six or a seven on a scale of uh, liberalness, I guess. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think we're also, because we tend to be people that uh, society wouldn't accept elsewhere, uh, that we're just kind of open-minded more so by uh, by design. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by yeah. a who's trying to argue with me here. Uh, the Las Vegas shooter, they never had a motive actually found. Uh, last I heard, they were trying to question his girlfriend who knew nothing about it. Uh, I did not mean to say one person earlier. I recognize that I meant to say one percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But the, th the fact that you're naming very specific uh, examples here just shows how uh, isolated it is when it basically every other mass shooting or bombing was done by right-wing extremists. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. I would say Islamic extremism. I'm not sure where you got the 81 percent being right wing. Uh, this is specifically in America, by the way. I do recognize that this is mm. totally different everywhere else in the world. That uh, we have a very yeah. unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get you. Yeah, I, I, I still, um, I, I guess you know, my my online experience is almost exclusively furry, so perhaps I'm simply not exposed to. Uh, the right wing stuff but it, even even in furry you know we have the we have what do they call them like foxes foxes friends and uh the furry raiders furry raiders that's it yeah and i don't really see much of them they don't sort of yeah you know, go around calling people out and calling causing a big problem i mean i don't know much about them but that, uh, that they kind of got... not invading my space right that <laughs> they're not they're not they're not vocal whereas uh... the far off is I, but I mean, I, I, I guess perhaps it is just that we live in a we live in an online furry society, at least, where the majority are left. Therefore, you're more likely to see left, and if you're not left, well, then there's more left to sort of <laughs> challenge challenge the fact you're not as well. Um, conformism is dangerous. Um, Absolutely, and that's something I did want to bring up uh, on the left wing extremist side when it comes to the internet. A big problem of it is gatekeeping where uh, we discussed it before, how echo chambers are created on social media, and mm -hmm. you're only going to see people you agree with. But as yeah. a result, it's going to be the loudest, uh, the most vocal, and the people with the most strict of terms as to what is and is not correct who are going to get to decide that narrative. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we've sort of discussed the social side of it there. I mean, I would say I'm socially slightly right wing. I'm not, I'm not like very right wing, but slightly. Um, but economically, I'm very left wing. I think that um, embracing giving money to the poor and higher taxes for the rich is a very good thing. Um, we have a lot of homeless people in the UK that I think we should be taking more care of. We need to give more money to public services, uh, single parents, the NHS, all this sort of stuff. So I, that's a, that's an interesting thing where. I don't know how common that is for someone to be economically one way and socially the other way. But... Uh, very, I know very few people who describe themselves that way. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I've said it before. I'm socially left-wing almost to a fault, where I'm going to say I, I wouldn't even call it left-wing. I'm very libertarian in that sense, where mm -hmm. as long as you're not hurting anyone else, I really don't care what you do. Yeah, yeah. But economically, you're also left-wing? Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm economically whatever makes sense, and what makes yeah, sense... Yeah, 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 You know, it's, we've been sold trickle-down economics here for the last 40 years, and it hasn't worked ever, so... Maybe we should try the opposite. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> Crazy thought, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, from... From the UK, I look at the US, and you guys don't have a public health service. You die if you're poor. That's crazy. I can't get mad around it. <laughs> it just seems like it's made up. You know what is that's so messed up. And unfortunately, every time we try to make any uh, we try to make any progress, and all we get is crumbs, which is a big issue with uh, yeah. uh the left wing in our country, where 
you know, any good uh, negotiator is going to say you want half a loaf of bread, you ask for the whole loaf. Yep. And yep, yep, yep. So we got Obamacare where he was asking for crumbs. And, you know, most people don't know this. Obamacare is a heritage foundation plan. Uh, that's a conservative think tank. And it was uh, initially instituted in Massachusetts by Mitt Romney. And uh, we got an even more conservative version of that because the Republican branch got to, yeah. they got to make their little changes, which in a lot of cases were specifically to try to destroy it. Uh, most famously, the death corridors was struck down by uh, uh, Marco Rubio, which mm -hmm. was supposed to address uh, rising premiums. And he specifically got rid of it, hoping to kill the bill. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a little off topic here. Yeah, it's it's um it's very strange. I mean, as I say again, looking looking in from the perspective of Europe and the UK, if one of your left wing candidates came to the UK and stood on a stage, we would say they were center. If one of your right wing candidates, you know, think of someone like Rick Santorum, if they came or or even Mitt Romney, if they came and presented their policies in the UK, we think they were satirical. You wouldn't be able to believe that it was real. It's um, yeah. <laughs> it shows that even, even, you know, two countries separated by a common language, they say. But your politics, although you say left and right, what I think of as left, is probably what you think of as like way left. So when I say I'm sort of probably center right, I'm probably center left in America. Oh uh, yeah, you'd be an '80s Democrat essentially. Mm, '80s. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> I was not implying anything there, but uh, I do recognize you are. You're in your 21s. It's how it goes. Yep, yep, yep. Shall we? Shall we move on? <laughs> Absolutely. And now we're getting even further into the weeds. Let's talk about automation. Yep. So this is something which um, a lot of people seem to fear. They're sort of thinking, well, if my job gets automated, well, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to um, pay the bills and such? Um, do you think they have a point? Uh, well, first, people forget that it might not be a one-to-one -one ratio, but uh, every time a job is gotten rid of by automation, it is often replaced with another more uh, skilled job. And unfortunately, especially in America, we aren't finding ways to uh, enfranchise lower classes who need that education to then fill those jobs. But if we were to uh, automate in conjunction with those sort of policies, then it wouldn't be that big a deal necessarily. Uh, people in the 80s, they used to look at automation as it, it could be the next great thing where suddenly people wouldn't have to work crappy jobs. We could focus on arts and culture and literature. But uh, it, it's historically, or historically, we've seen that anytime a new technology comes out, uh, look at the cotton gin. Uh, what should be a machine that does the work of 10 people now becomes the expectation that one person is uh, supposed to have 10 times more productivity. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the people who are less educated and do these unskilled jobs, they're not going to suddenly get more skills to do skilled jobs just because their job got automated away. And then you're you're left with um we have a lot of towns in the north of england where historically they were mining towns or factory towns and those jobs have to some degree been automated already and these towns are just destitute and this is 20 30 years ago this has happened um 35 years ago margaret thatcher's administration and they just haven't recovered and nothing has really been done to revitalize these places they're just sort of forgotten and and um if if that's happened for the past 30 years, do we really have any basis by which to say that we should or or uh, should hope the future would be any better? I think that there are definitely steps we could be taking. Uh, we do have could, to take... But will we? The... You're asking me just how optimistic I am about... Mm, uh, pol exactly. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, no, we also can't forget that a lot of these people, especially here in America, we talk about it a lot with the coal miners. Yeah, uh, Many of them have been given alternatives. They've been offered training. There are plenty of other jobs to take, but they don't want those. They want their jobs back. Yeah, yeah. And 
I really have trouble blaming a 60 year old who spent the last 40 years of their life doing the same thing, not wanting to have to learn a brand new skill, but at the same time, it's kind of necessary. Do you think it's the case that it's just when the old people die, it'll fix itself, as, as macabre as it sounds? You know, I've thought about that a lot, and oh, while I don't think it'll fix the entirety of the problem, I think it will make a huge difference. Mm. I think um, there's the same sort of argument to be said of the political class. I think the older white male who sets the more conservative agenda, once they all cock it, they're probably things will become more liberal. I think uh, our generation is starting to get into politics, you know, people in their mid to late 20s. Um, and as those people move into their 30s and 40s, I think policy change will shift towards the left, become a, hopefully make a difference to these people whose jobs are getting automated. Um, more care to those who need it. I think what's most important, though, is that if we're going to be looking at the new generation taking over, we need to be doing everything in our power to ensure that they are capable of taking over these new jobs that are going to be developed. Uh, as in providing better skills to the workforce, you mean? Uh, uh, providing education as far as those who uh, will then go into this automative maintenance uh, offering more vocational training for those who are going to be going into crafts and Yep. I, I like the idea that arts and literature will become more um, acceptable as a career. Um, so you won't get frowned at until you're never going to make any money being an author or whatever. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm being cynical, but I still sort of think, oh, who's going to fund that? What does, it, what does it provide? The government looks at productivity and says, well, that's not generating much money, so we're not going to put any funding in for that. Um, the value of, of culture is uh, not capitalistic in nature, and therefore governments don't like it. <laughs> Can't tax that. And that's just kind of inherently how capitalism works. It's uh, uh, When you measure how well your country is doing by economic productivity, then it's just going to totally ignore the contributions being done elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm, it's uh, interesting, you look at the happiness of countries against their GDP per capita, and some of the countries which are the poorest have the happiest people, because they realized, well, it don't matter really how much money we have, we find ways to be happy anyway. I think consumerism as a, as a force in uh, the more economically developed countries can definitely be a bad thing. And not to mention that uh, the countries that have the highest GDP per capita are going to be countries like Japan and America, where, I mean, frankly, we're overworked. Yeah. Uh, there was research released earlier this week in the UK, and I think they said we work 43 or 44 hours a week, and the European average is 41 and a half, I think it was. So that's quite a lot. I do hope I do hope for a positive future with automation. I think the benefits, if we get it right, will be enormous. People not having to pick strawberries in a field. I mean, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. You should, you should, people shouldn't have to live like that for twenty years just to make sixty pounds a week or whatever. It's um not a not a good way to live. I do hope we can get this right, but I think. I try not to be too cynical, but realistically, I look at our parliament yelling at each other about Brexit and all this bullshit, and I'm like, yeah, there's no way you guys are going to get this right. They can't even agree on science of global warming, for goodness sake. And so how are you going to get something high tech correct if you can't even look at a graph and say, yeah, looks like we're warming the world. We maybe should start that, right? <laughs> no, I'm glad that you mentioned the picking strawberry thing. Uh... A lot of people are worried when automation comes that they're going to be losing these jobs because it's going to be cheaper, but we already don't pay, especially for uh, the farming jobs for those working, you know, uh, register at McDonald's. They aren't making enough to sustain themselves. Mm. So why not automate it? Why should a job exist if you cannot pay enough to subsidize a life? Especially since what that means is they are using their lives to subsidize your business. Yeah. It definitely puts the priority in the wrong place. 
Uh, Mr. Wimp wanted to say that the average work week in Germany is between 36 and 40 hours. I'm going to need a source on that. I'm sorry, my man. Uh, I'm seeing as far back as 2012, it was 35, and about two and a half years ago, they moved to 28. I, I'm sure that's not going to count stuff like uh, farming jobs, uh, uh, things where it's hard to quantify those deals, but it, it would more refer to office jobs and stuff like that. I think uh, the I mean, the strawberry picking is actually a really good idea, because of, uh, a really good example, rather, because in conjunction with Brexit, a lot of the immigrants from Eastern Europe come here to do that kind of job. So if we automate it, I guess people in the UK would generally see that as a good thing, because it means they means they're going to be giving jobs to these people anymore. Um, it's funny how everything fits together. All righty, do we want to go ahead and move on to our next topic? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty, our next topic is running a business. Uh, something I'm interested in doing and something that you have uh, some direct experience doing. Uh, would you like to go ahead and start? Yeah, I, I've been running various businesses since I was, uh, well, I first, I first was self-employed when I was 13, albeit with uh, parents' help. Uh, and then when I was 18, I, wrote, I started my first business. I was a freelance writer for three years. Then since then, my um, I worked as a software engineer for a little bit, but then my prof professorial work is in uh, educational neuroscience, so educational technology. I do business stuff for that, basically enabling people to get the most out of their time, learn in the most efficient ways, uh, basically combining neuroscience with efficient learning techniques. And yeah, so I've got a, a bit of a bit of a mix all over the place with this sort of thing. I've done private tuition as well. So I'd much uh, ha having run my own businesses, there's no way in hell I'd work for someone else again. <laughs> and I could, having done both, yeah, no, you you couldn't pay me enough. You couldn't pay me enough. It's not like you don't have a boss though, as opposed to working for the betterment of someone else's livelihood. Uh, you're working for what thirty thousand people's in this case? Uh, even I, you don't have but a direct I get to choose though. It's it's it, in in a sense it's sort of like being a a politician or something. Yes, you're serving your constituents, but you have autonomy to do basically what you want. And okay, you you'll get judged well or not well by the people you serve based on the choices you make. But that's your autonomy, and that's something that's very important to me. Whereas working for um, a company, I'd be told, you know, go and do this, go and do that. And I also don't like the idea that I'm being siphoned for some of the money I'm making. So my first company that I worked for, uh, there were leaked documents that showed per employee they were getting paid about, God, what would it be in dollars? About $320,000 on average per employee. And as a graduate, I was making forty. Forty-one thousand dollars or something. So that's a you know I was barely getting ten to fifteen percent of my worth, and that made me very 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 angry. And this is one of the main reasons why I quit my uh, first job, because I felt like I was being very much taken advantage of. And and knowing that kind of statistic now, you there's no way in hell I'd work for someone else because I feel well, you're just using me to make money, and that don't sit well with me at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm fortunate to make uh, what is in North Carolina slightly above a living wage, at least uh, in the city I live. But I, I do work retail, and let me say there really isn't all that much more disheartening than working for 15 minutes and taking more money than I'm going to make in a month and putting it in that register. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think it, it doesn't matter how much you make when you have the knowledge that relative to how much you're worth, you're really not getting much of it. That's not, <laughs> it, it can't sit well with you at that point. It wouldn't have mattered. I mean, I, since then I've, I've worked freelance for some of the larger companies and I've been paid you know, six digits, but not close to what they're getting for me. And I don't like that. I don't like it at all. And I, yeah, it's not a, it's a psychological thing, um, so the feeling taken advantage of, but also needing to choose what I do. 
I don't like, I'm not going to have someone tell me what to do. The, the worst thing in the world is being managed by someone who's stupid because they make stupid choices and stupid decisions. And then you have to go and implement it. It's like, ugh. my, my um, first ever manager, he was a physics graduate from Oxford and he was in his sort of mid thirties and he thought he was, the sh and he was really, really, really stupid. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go in, um, go in a meeting room with him and I'd write out binomial distributions on whiteboards and I'd explain to him why his ideas were wrong and I'd, I'd say look you're putting us on a project that's three people's work for six months for a two percent increase in productivity what are you doing why are you doing this and it, it sort of it didn't matter because he said do it and that was just absolutely intolerable it's definitely one thing to make your own mistakes or have your own incompetence and have to take over for that, but to do it on someone else's win is... Yeah. I mean, it's depressing. I've been able to point out so many changes. I've been with my job for longer than I care to admit at this point, and they have made so many changes trying to corporatize uh, to uh, try to purvey an image where in reality what they're doing is just kind of shooting wild and making us pick up the scraps. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, extremely frustrating. When you can notice it, I, I guess most people don't notice and they can't figure out, well, my manager's actually stupid. Yeah, they might think their manager's stupid, but when you can actually notice, you're wrong because of this and because of this and because of this and corporate doesn't know this and this and this. It's really demoralizing. So yeah, I, I think the uh, the autonomy and also the not being taken advantage of, yeah, that's why I would only ever run my business from this point. Uh, so should we be pushing more people to try to be their own boss, or should we be uh, finding ways to, I don't know, give the little people more representation in their corporations? I know that uh, in America, we've really shut down uni unionization. Uh, my first, literally my first day at work, I remember this years ago, uh, I got paid for the whole day to sit there and watch an hour and a half of what was essentially just anti-union. And propaganda. I think that I would never, ever, ever encourage someone I love to go and work for someone else. I think it's a abusive system. I any anyone who's been with me or been around me for long periods, I know I'm a massive advocate of running your own business. Always looking for that sort of thing. Um, so I would say, yeah, there's no way in hell I'd put someone I love working in anywhere. <laughs> it's just not a, yeah, no. Do, I, I think. Hmm, go on. Do you get that same sort of discontentment working as a teacher? Well, I'm self-employed, though. That's the thing. So I can go to universities as I wish and, and basically sell them a lecture course. So I can say, look, I want to teach this subject. I'm going to teach this sort of topics. Are you interested? And so I'm still working for myself at that point. It's not like I'm employed by the university. I would never, I would never work for a school like, you know, get paid twenty five thousand a year. I'm having a laugh. Never in a million years, and I, I wouldn't want to work for a, a a single university and get get told. It's like I was saying in the podcast on Monday about how one of the worst things as, as a lecturer is when you're prescribed what to teach. I don't want to be told what to teach. I want to teach what I'm passionate about. So I'm. That's really just another another business thing. It's not it's not employment really, not in the conventional sense. Goodness, got me thinking here tonight just how badly I need to, you know, get out of my job, be my own boss. Yeah, well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> you, you know, you want something enough. You really want something. You don't just say you want it, then you go and do it. That's what I did. You know, everyone at my uh, old work thought I was absolutely not squaring. They couldn't, they couldn't believe it. They were like, what are you doing? You're, you're packing up and moving 200 miles to the other end of the country, and that's it? Like, but yeah, of course, there was no way in hell I was going to stay there. Um, and that, you know, okay, I was afraid and it was uh, difficult at points, but there's not a single day I regret it. <laughs> I love it. It's the best decision I ever made. Never would go back. I've got freedom now. Uh, that is something I... What to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, that is something I desperately need more of in my life, and I'm sure anyone Make here it happen. Cry Make it happen. And I'm sure it's something everyone can relate to. Um, uh, before we move on... There's a, there's a thing, sure, everyone can relate to it, but every morning when you get up and you go to your same job and you just say, yeah, well, okay, I'll deal with it for another month. I'll deal with it, yeah, but just, just until Christmas, or I'll deal with it another day. You're digging your own grave and you're not actually making change. You can say you want something, all you want, but you don't need it. If you need it, you would do something about it. I think there's an awful lot of people who complacently fall into the trap of, yeah, I want chains, but I don't, re I don't really want it enough to grab it and do something with it. That's the spark you need. And anyone listening who, who doesn't like their job or they're sick of it, well, do something about it. Go and apply for something different. Go and start a business, even if it's in your spare time at the start. Because you can talk shit all you want. You can talk, talk and say, blah, 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 blah. Don't mean jack shit until you go and do something with that. Uh, so what do you say to someone who is just terrified of taking that first step, especially if do they're... Do in your spare time. You, you, you get home from work, and yeah, you're tired, you feel shit, but if you really want to make a change, find an hour a day to go and study and focus on what you're doing. Do market research. Go and figure out, okay, how do I make a basic website in WordPress? How do I uh, look into my competitors? What do I need to... How much money do I need to start manufacturing a small, small amount of the products I want to sell? Who do I talk to? There's, there's little steps you can take in just half an hour or an hour a day. And you, you can find that time if you want to. How much time do people spend just sat around doing fuck all in a day, watching TV or whatever? Use that time. Get up an hour earlier if you must. That way you're less tired before. You know, one of the things I, uh, against his will almost, I advocate the guy I live with that he goes to bed every night at 8.45 p.m. And he gets up every single morning at five in the morning because I say to him, you get up at five because you do your best hours of, of productivity before you go to work. He does meditation. He does exercise five till six in the morning, six till eight. He works on personal projects after he's had his breakfast and shower. And he's got a good hour and a half there of personal projects done. Now that's business stuff. That's uh, working on uh, software engineering he wants to do. And then he goes to work and and then in the evening, he doesn't have to, to be tired and then worry about, oh, what am I going to do? So if you can force yourself into doing it, getting up at five in the morning is the best way. Not many, it takes discipline, but if you can not ignore your alarm when it goes off, get out of bed. I do want to mention, though, uh, this is America specific, but I know a lot of folk are disheartened that they really, it's hard to find that opportunity when it's over 60% of Americans don't have enough savings to cover a $500 emergency. But it's, but, but it's not, it's not finding the opportunity, it's creating the opportunity. If you wait to find an opportunity, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life. The people who succeed with this are the people who actually create it. And yes, you, you might be stuck in a situation where you don't have 500 in the bank, but if you keep going to work, well, that clearly isn't working for you. You're not making any savings by doing your job as is, so you may as well at least try to do something on the side. It's not like you're quitting your job, like, point blank to do, to do something. Most people don't have the luxury to do that, but you can at least spend half an hour or an hour a day to actually create that opportunity. Give yourself the chance, at least rather than wait for, oh, I might win the lottery, if something might come along. Screw that. Create your own opportunity. I mean, fundamentally, I agree. You know, we are just so beaten down here that... And I'm sure you feel the same way over there. Maybe not you personally, but a lot of the well, disenfranchised folk... Abs absolutely, though, but, but that's what I'm saying about... Yeah, you say you want it, you're tired, you're bored with your job. But if you really, 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 really want it, go do it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just talk. Alrighty, uh, before we move on, I did want to remind folk that at any point, if you want us to discuss a topic, you can leave your suggestions in Floof Talk right above this voice chat. Or if anyone's posted anything on Twitch, that'll be... Uh, shuttled on to us. I'm not sure if there have been any questions. I've not gotten any messages from our streaming admins. Uh, I do want to skip this next topic, though. 
Uh, yeah, we can we can skip it. Uh, firing death. Uh, he says he don't doesn't want to completely flip the vibe that's going on right now. But can any of us make convincing animal sounds? You go first. <laughs> A convincing animal sound? Yeah. What does the skunk say? Well, skunks usually just go ah. Yeah, we I'm have two. <laughs> We have these little cute little chitters. We go, ding, 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 or we just scream. Red panda style. How about? <laughs> there you go. That, that's, that's as cute as you're going to get. <laughs> I can't roar. I'm too gay. So I won't. <laughs> Uh, you're saying that you are the you're supposed to be a gay icon and you can't you know katie perry for us i can i can sing katie perry i'm not going to because someone will clip it and then it will get sent on twitter and i'll be embarrassed <laughs> maybe another time get me drunk i drink once a year for christmas so at christmas record me in karaoke voice when i'm too drunk to say no <laughs> absolutely i've got that marked down on my calendar i'm ready for this I didn't drink last Christmas, so I'm allowed two drinks this year. <laughs> All right, shall we? Uh, shall we move on? Um, yeah, we're just shit posting right now. Uh, so the next topic is first suiting. Is it worth it? Yeah, they're expensive, aren't they? Uh, I was disheartened to see how much a full suit would cost. I gotta scale back a little bit before I get mine. You think you'd start with a partial like pause or a, a head first? Uh, I'm likely just going to do the. Well, I've got to go with the head because you know that's most of the point of first suiting. And yeah. uh, what is Nova without a big floofy tail? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a, a fair point. I saw Ventus's tail recently, and I'm like, oh, that looks good. <laughs> Very blue. Now, uh, I'm sure for a lot of people, first suiting obviously isn't going to be worth it, but. Uh, for folk like me, uh, who might struggle to perform or are just generally socially anxious. Uh, when I brought this up to a friend of mine, I don't know how many people here watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, but Charlie has this thing where he has trouble going out and uh, having fun in public, so he wears this green mesh suit and he calls himself Green Man. And it lets him go out and act a fool. <laughs> And I think it's really the same idea here, where you put on the mask, and there are studies that show that, uh, I wish I could find one right quick, but, you know, when you're wearing a mask of some sort, it becomes a lot less, it, it doesn't feel like anything might be directed toward you, more so the character you're playing, and therefore you feel yeah. more comfortable, you know, acting a fool. And me, I am a, I don't think I'm ever going to grow up. I'm always going to be a child at heart, which means I want to mm -hmm. go out there and act a fool and have a good time and just be silly. And unfortunately, I also have way too much self-respect, so I'm also not about, <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I, I'm not about to go act all cutesy in public, especially as someone who, oh my goodness, I'm going to hit my mid-21 soon. Uh, I, I think, um, oh, do you think that perhaps in the future, as you become more comfortable with yourself, you will be more uh, more able to have fun as yourself because i think uh, a lot of self-confidence is not really caring what other people think of you and, and that's a healthy healthy thing to have i think hiding intentionally behind a, a mask or a fursuit isn't gonna really it's, it's sort of like hiding from the problem addressing the problem feels more you know you, you wouldn't cure cancer by putting a plaster on it that's my Sort of analogy here. And while you're right, unfortunately, uh, I would also start to feel uh, the older I get, and it is true, the older I've gotten and the more I've worked at it, the more confident I felt about doing stuff like this. But yeah, uh, the furry fandom trends younger, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to finally be able to have fun at the age of thirty-five, where I'm going to feel really out of place going to a convention. Do you think you will still be a furry when you're 35? Ten years from now? I'd like to hope so. Yeah, it's um. When I was when I was younger, I became a furry 
God, it's so long. It's like 17 years nearly. Jesus Christ. When I became a furry, I thought I'd be a furry forever, but now I've been a furry for this long. I probably don't think I'll be a furry forever. The the um the community doesn't really align with with how I view the world at my age. It's it's very um I I, I don't want to say the the furry fandom is immature, but there are many things where I don't, I think you see the world in your late 21s as an, as very much an adult world, whereas I think a lot of even the younger adults, 19, 20, don't, it's hard to connect with that sort of worldview. And of course I appreciate it, I empathise with it, because I was there, but they can't really empathise with mine, and they, they will in time, but I feel a little bit out of place sometimes uh, because of that sort of thing. Um, though, though, obviously, the older you get, in theory, at least, the more capable you are of affording a first suit. <laughs> uh, when I did the research for one of our podcasts before, I did go through uh, several years of the big furry survey that they used to do. Mm -hmm. And, well, they still do it, but it, it's done by a different group, and it's not nearly as extensive, unfortunately. But the fandom has started trending older over the last several years. Uh, uh, we mentioned before that uh, whatever that uh, furry personals uh, website was, Pounced, I believe. Pounced, yes. Yeah. Uh, that there is just a huge drop off after 25, but now oh, I, yeah. uh, the, uh, while it's not the average age, I think the median age is something like 26, 27 now. Seriously? Uh, yeah, I was I mean, surprised. I, sort of, I, th I think in, I look at FV and I sort of think, okay, how many, because the, if the median is 26, 27, you're saying half of our furs are older than 26, 27. I don't believe that. I would say the median was more like 21, 22. We have a lot of people who are in college. We have a lot of people in high school. We have probably about the same amount, like me and you, who are older than 21, 22. The median's 27. We have, that would mean we have a lot of furries in our 30s. No, we don't. I, I would like to think, I don't see why Effie wouldn't be a representative sample of the fandom, so I can't believe that. Uh, perhaps it's just that, uh, as we said before, as you get older, you have less time to be fuzzy. I'm sure that there's a Maybe. a lot of older folk that still identify as furry, but just don't have the time to contribute. That many, though? Hmm, I don't know. It does, uh... I, th I think, um... While I don't think I could justify the price of a fursuit as a personal item. And, and I know you sort of mentioned the, the social value of it. I, I'm quite comfortable <laughs> without, a, without a, a mask, physical or otherwise. So uh, it doesn't really have as much social value to me. But I think the business value of getting one is um, certainly a thing when you have a brand like Majira Strawberry, where you're, I presume the monetization that uh, Majira gets from YouTube is quite significant. And if you have a fursuit, almost like a business item uh, in that sense, then I could definitely see that. A Kiros fursuit for Furry Valley is something that I considered buying. Uh, have, have, I haven't gone as far as buying one yet, but I have actually spoken with a fursuit maker and inquired as to how much it would be. So I guess, um, you know, you've got the personal value and the social value of it, and, and then the in some cases, the business and economical value of it. I know a lot of fursuiters wouldn't really be into monetization or YouTube or branding or whatever else it may be, but um, I guess there's many, many ways to take value from these sorts of things. I would be happy to volunteer as you're a curious fursuiter, but unfortunately, I'm not big nor chonky. <laughs> you're a bit that. small, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our mascot's like seven feet tall, four hundred pounds, and you're like a cute little skunky. <laughs> don't make fun of me for suffering from small. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it just, you know, it just means you can kidnap easier. I've discussed it before. Uh, I am comfortable with my size. I've gotten used to it at this point, and you know, I like being cute and cuddly. But there is that uh, innate people are less likely to take you seriously sort of deal. I think that's a good thing. Huh? Generally, um, I do a lot of competitive things, various fields, and when people underestimate me, that's very dangerous for them because they tend to be quite slack about how they do things when they're like that. So in a competitive environment, that's, that could be a very good thing. 
I wouldn't, uh, you know, in some ways I wish I was smaller. <laughs> I mean, I'm not huge or anything, but no one would look at me and think, lol, shrimpy guy probably can't do anything. If I was a much more nefarious skunko, there's a, uh, there's a lot to weaponize there. People just <laughs> bless me. <laughs> uh huh. Anyway, uh, we're about an hour in. I'm happy to keep chatting for a little bit. Once again, if anyone has any topics, go ahead and put that in the Floof Talk text chat or into the Twitch chat. Uh, we do have one more topic if we wanted to discuss that tonight. Uh, there do, was... any you, do any of you have any topics? We'll give you just sort of 20, 30 seconds in Floof Talk, anyone who's here or on the Twitch chat. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead with that. They don't need to be grand discussion topics. Uh, it can be it... cute stuff, yeah, funny stuff to finish with, little things. Lions are the best species, if anyone wants to ask what are the best species. Mm. Just nod and say yes, Simba. I don't know anything about the PS2. Uh, oh, there anyway. was someone who wanted to know about uh, uh, retro gaming. Do you have a favorite old video game? No. <laughs> no. Sorry. RuneScape. Oh. RuneScape, of course. <laughs> uh, that game, unless you're playing old school. It was released in 2001. Come on, if that's not retro. Uh, when did Rune RuneScape 3 come out, though? Uh... I don't know. Like, well, it's they call it 07 Scape, don't they? So it must be 2007 or 2008 that R3 came out. No, uh, 07 would have been uh, shortly before they released Summoning. So EOC. Well, OSRS is what like they call. Yeah. 2007 Scape. And that was before EOC. So it must have been 2007 or 2008 that R3 came out. Dancing. Water music's good. I like water and pop. Shall we go with with our final topic? Uh, sure. Okay. So this is a conversation I've had like three or four times now over the last week and a half. Uh, I wanted to talk about foot, American football versus rugby. And reason being there have been all those studies that have come out over the last couple of years that uh, showed the huge amounts of CTE. I think that stands for uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Yep. Uh, Concussion-related trauma. And the I was totally surprised by this. Uh, Fifty percent of all high school football players will get CTE. Seventy-five percent of college players and ninety-nine percent of professional players will develop CTE, which is uh, related to lack of uh, functioning uh, uh, mental faculties. Uh, it increases aggression, uh, decreases your short and long-term memory. It's it's a serious issue, especially since. Uh, one of the big arguments is, well, yeah, it's going to be part of the job. You're making millions of dollars. Yeah, so. yeah. But college students aren't making any of that money. High schoolers aren't making any of that money. I know yeah, we spoke to I one think... of our trialists who said he had nine concussions playing high school to college. That is kind of crazy. I, I think um, college kids are old enough to make their own decisions. So I, I don't think you should baby those. But kids in high school... Um, getting concussions that's not okay you know we shouldn't be exposing our children to situations in which they can get seriously injured um yeah that's a that's a problem um but addressing this is it's a difficult issue because a lot of these ct type trauma is built up over time so you would have a brain scan you can't see anything wrong for years in some cases you can have uh, take people off the field if they've had a knock to the head, give them concussion testing, see how they are in 15 minutes. I mean, that's what we tend to do uh, in the UK for most of our sports. But it's not perfect. This is a, quite a quite a difficult diagnosed problem and being a long-term problem as well. Uh, boxing is another sport uh, in the UK as well, which uh, suffers from the same sort of thing. Who would have thought getting punched in the head 75 times <laughs> an hour would do that? <laughs> I think um, it's interesting though because we in in the U, in in Europe we laugh at American football and we think lol it's rugby but they're just covered in padding like man we call them, them pansies like we think they're just softies because they need all that padding and we play rugby of course it's just rugged you don't have any of that shit you go down you go down hard on the on the ground it's not 
none of this sort of helmets or padding that weighs 100 pounds or not on all over your body and shit um it's 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 sort of interesting as well with the World Cup at the moment. It's coincidental, but UK actually or England actually played the US today. I didn't even know you guys played rugby. <laughs> Apparently, you're in the World Cup. Oh wow, go us! Yeah, <laughs> we, um, we won. I think we won. We got like seven tries. I think a try is basically the same as what you guys call a touchdown in American football. It's probably different in some way, but it's where they put the ball on the floor. Uh, that's, my, that's my technical understanding of these guys. I don't play or watch either, but it was just on the news. So. <laughs> um, but there was uh, there was one American guy who uh, in the in the game today, he tackled one of the English players and like shoulder barged him in the jaw, and it's like Jesus Christ, that's quite vicious. You even got sent off for it, but you think, God damn, he weren't even close to the ball. <laughs> He's playing the wrong game. He should be an American football player. <laughs> you know, as a quick aside, you mentioned it. Uh, you said boxing is really big in England. Is uh, it's, it's has not that really happened? big, but it's it's you know we do have boxers. You you know you'd recognize the top couple of boxers probably if you saw them on the street. Uh, I read a study a couple of years ago that discussed the differences between MMA and boxing. I'm a big MMA fan. I used to mm -hmm. do martial arts growing up until I got hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there isn't nearly that same uh, level of CTE, but you know, you break your body down so much faster and I have to imagine mm -hmm. that it's uh, yeah, you don't have all that padding, but as a result, you aren't running full force leading with your head. Uh, but there's got to be a lot more uh, damage to the rest of your body. But I almost want to say that's irrelevant because you can still think and be productive and create art in a wheelchair. But if your brain is mush, then I mean, what what are you going to do? Well, I, I suppose um, that there are a lot of people who are. <laughs> quite low functioning shall we say who who managed perfectly fine as football commentators 20 years after they retire so I, I don't think it's that they get their brains moosh they might they might be a bit more stupid than they would have been otherwise but um honestly if you could if you could give me the choice when i was say 12 13 years old that i could have 50 million dollars and have some sort of thing that made me a bit more stupid because I've been smacked around the head a few times or I could be poor and not have that I'd choose the money I think most people would I think um your original point about protecting high school and stuff is a very good one but if you're a professional who's made so much money yeah we should be taking more care of people we should have at least at the very least the 15 minute checks we have in in the UK and Europe uh with the equivalent sports but let's not be under any to any um uh, under any confusion here these people are making a lot a lot a lot of money so i wouldn't feel too sorry for them uh, but uh something like a thousandth of a percent of all college players will ever get to grow up and be pro and you don't get to be a player in college unless you played in high school and that's i mean unless you're playing for some crappy little 500 person college but I mean, it, it's it's worth pointing out in the UK, we don't have anything like this. So that the idea that people go to watch a college team play is absurd to me. Why would I go and watch a university team play? They're all shit. It's, um, it's because you guys draft from colleges and stuff, but there's no sort of equivalent here. Um, so I'm not... Uh... Yeah, that, that's that's weird in itself to me. I don't really understand why. Why you guys do that um, uh, it's because it makes you a lot of money yeah but why do they have to go to college if i look if i'm 14 years old and i'm playing for the youth team of one of our best football clubs i ain't going to college where would i go to college i'm going to be a footballer and the, the idea that you guys have sports sports scholarships and you put them through three or four years of college to go and play american football what's the point if you weren't in classes and you were just playing American football and training, you'd be a lot better by the time you graduated. So I, d I don't understand 
what's the point of giving that tertiary education to a guy who's going to play football if it seems pointless? Uh, it's a host of factors. Uh, first off, we are, especially in America, very tribalist. So being able to give you a team with colors and yeah, yeah. that's going to bring people in and make them more excited to root for their team. Uh, not yeah. to mention, it's the funniest thing. Uh, America is very, uh, I, I love the comparison, whereas most people see uh, parts of Europe as being more socialist than America, the way we treat our sports are significantly more socialist, where uh, y'all have uh, uh, your uh, budget caps are significantly smaller for your clubs, or, or rather they're much larger. You can It's whoever has the most money gets the best players. Whereas yeah. here we have our draft system where the worst people get the first pick at who they want. Yeah, that's uh I, I don't know how it works. So at the end of the season, are all your players put back into the draft or do you keep the people you had in the last season? Then you draft new ones to add to those the next uh yeah, you add uh, every player has the opportunity to join what is called the lottery where Okay. Uh, be accepted for the draft. Uh but uh, no, everyone else is contracted, and they say until the end of their contract where they can then choose to be a free agent. Okay, right, right. So it's not the case that literally every season everyone goes back into the lottery. And then you... No, no, yeah, no, no. Okay. Because <laughs> I thought, like, well, yeah, how do you build up any kind of cohesion if they're right? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, the difference between American and English sports is uh, is soccer like that. What, what you call soccer like that? Uh, the same? You have a draft for that? Uh, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. I don't follow soccer because uh, I played for 14 years, so uh, watching the sport is very, very boring. Yeah, okay. Interesting. I was, uh, I was um, more into sort of sports where I've got something in my hand, like um, table tennis, tennis, pool, that sort of thing. Yeah. Pick into sports with balls and sticks and Sounds about right. I can hit something with. <laughs> Ball um, sticks and hitting things. That is Simba to a T. Absolutely. There was, um, when I was 16, there was a guy who came out with, with a pool, picked him up and threw him over my shoulder and then nicked his pool cue and took my shot. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yep. <laughs> the, so, moral of the story, don't attack me with a pool cue. <laughs> It feels like the worst thing you could attack someone with. Those things are meant to break. No, 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 no. You can kill someone with a pool cue. <laughs> For sure. I've nearly killed someone with a pool ball before. Jesus Christ. I, um... Uh, when a when a professional semi-pro pool player breaks, the white can go... Cue ball can go 30, 35 miles an hour. And I uh, put a bit too much of an angle on my cue and I broke and the white ball... The cue ball, uh, it, what do you you call it? The point in America, I think, like the it hit the sort of first ball, but it went slightly off the side of it and it jumped. And there was a guy uh, sat uh, watching in the audience, and it missed his head by half a centimeter, probably. Probably oh, would have done God. serious damage. <laughs> yeah, those things are they're heavy. Yeah, uh, yeah. There is a, a video, um, give you an idea of the speed, there's a video on YouTube and it's cued the break and the pool table, the professional pool table is nine foot long and the, the cue ball vaults over the entire table. So that's, you know, on a miss cue, I'm still firing at 11 feet. <laughs> so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of speed on that. You can, can definitely hurt someone. And the pool cue is heavy. They can be 19 ounces, the heavy ones, uh, one pound, three ounces. Definitely hurt someone with that. <laughs> uh, so did you play pool or did you play snooker because i know that play uh, both. Play both. Uh, snooker um, just does not exist here well yeah I, I'm, I mean pool is where the money is so a lot of people in the uk who are good at snooker or in europe and they're good at snooker they'll go to america to play pool and they'll tour and i had a choice to do that i could have uh could have done that if i wanted to um but you, there's a lot of traveling involved. America is very, very large, and you might be in a tournament on the East Coast one week, and then the West Coast the next week, and 
Uh, you know, you've got to hustle in local places as well. You play people like twenty dollars a a rack, they call it in in uh in the US or a frame, we would call it in the in the UK. Um, but a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, as I said, tennis, tennis, and table tennis as well. I was really freaking good at table tennis. <laughs> I really enjoy all sorts of parlor games like that. I'm a big pool mm-hmm. player. I'm I'm really good at darts. Oh wow, darts! That's not something many Americans know of. <laughs> that, that used to, that was essentially the entirety of my junior year in college. I'd get my work. Right. I'd uh, go over to a friend's house. We'd drink, play darts for a couple hours. <laughs> did, did did other people know what it was? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. I played darts growing up because. Uh, that's how my parents met. They were also parlor game players. Uh, right. Uh, they met bowling. They played darts and pool together all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's what yeah. I did growing up. Yeah, gosh, gosh. We don't really, um, that's the thing. We don't really have bowling in the UK, but we have something called bowls. Do you know what that is? <laughs> oh, is that a bocce? I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, yeah, lawn bowling. Where it, it, yeah, it, lawn bowling. Yes, yeah. lawn bowling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, I love bocce. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's from the French game Bulls. There's a there's a little yellow one that you roll first, and it, the the field is quite long. It must be like forty fifty meters. You roll this thing, and then uh you have big heavy black ones called jacks. And do uh, no the 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 jack is the yellow one. I can't remember what the big ones are called, but you you try to roll them and get as close as you can to the the yellow one. Is uh, you score points based on how close you get. It's a very gentlemanly game, rarely played by anyone under the age of ninety. But that's how you came version of bowling. <laughs> like your great granddad would always go bowling, and that's just what well, lawn bowling, and that's uh yeah. <laughs> oh, it's been. I love lawn games like that. Uh, yeah, uh, I love badminton. <laughs> Badminton's fun. I was good at that too. Have you ever played squash? Um, no, I don't think uh, I've ever met anyone that's ever played squash in real life. That's, uh, it's not huge here, but you, in every gym you can play it, they'll have squash courts and such. Uh, we play racquetball instead, as a rule. What's racquetball? Uh, it's more or less the same, if I'm correct. Okay. Uh, but you use a smaller, uh, much faster moving ball. Much faster? Squash ball can go like 200 miles an hour. <laughs> Like the shit I'd like uh, oh oh no no I guess I I've got that backwards Jesus Christ those things are tiny yeah yeah squash ball is very small it, it's squash but with a ball that's twice the size essentially oh okay so much less fast pace then I guess so uh huh uh huh yeah oh, I don't I'm not very good at it <laughs> anyway. Alrighty. Uh does not look like we got any more topics in floof talk or anything. So uh do we want to go ahead and wrap up? Yeah, I can do. I, th- I think we proved uh in that final topic that neither of us know much or really care much about rugby or American football. But we were into other sports though, so got some uh <laughs> some decent topic I guess. Alrighty. Well, I-, I did enjoy it regardless. Yeah, every every time I like this highlight of my week. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, f- had a fabulous time. Just wanted to remind everyone that we're going to be uh, having our podcast Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, this week's topic is going to be Zootopia Bound, the new furry generation. Uh, we're going to be discussing all of the great things that has all of these new young furries joining uh, Zootopia. Uh, what was that movie? Alpha and Omega. I see a lot of people talking about that. I tried watching it and I thought it was terrible. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, all that wonderful stuff. If you're interested in learning about all of the new furry media that's come out, be sure to join us on Monday. Of course, we'll also be hosting our Floof Talk next week, Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And please type attend Floof Talk in the ranking system chat to get your XP. Appreciate you reminding me. Did you put that in speaking voice? Yes. Yes, I did. Someone in uh, someone in Twitch chat has said the noises that you made of skunks remind him of an opossum friend of his who likes to scream. There you go. <laughs> I am not going to take anything from that statement. But I'm not sure if I should be offended or. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's for the best. <laughs> And just a reminder, if any of you have any topic suggestions between now and next week at any time, 
you can post them in the Flute Talk text chat or on Telegram, send them to at Flurry Valley Support Bot, and our support team will send them on to myself or to Nova. Hopefully, uh, our man Sandeep's going to be working that day. Sandeep is amazing. Sandeep yeah, absolutely. Is and he his, makes uh, sure that no one is causing the dramas. Yep, and Harpreet is his uh, his friend. And they had a supervisor. Uh, Sandeep supervisor contacted one of uh, the people who contacted us as customer support bot. Hey, did you know Sandeep got a 6 out of 10 rating most recently? Good for he's him. I know he's high. been working hard for that. He has. He's, on, he's on track for a promotion. He's um, currently his supervisor is random sampling 100 people who contact our customer support bot, which may, basically means let's stop streaming before we expose too much <laughs> goodness gracious all right folks uh, thanks for coming out uh, seriously thanks, i love doing these events <laughs> we wouldn't do it if it weren't for y'all coming to listen well you don't want to hang out with me just wow okay i'm offended now all right bye everyone <laughs> uh, boy you know you can get this out of me at any point if you just get me drinking but at least if i do it this way it's productive fair enough all right see you later everyone thank you bye-bye have a wonderful night